My name is Paul Edwards. I teach at the University of Michigan. I'm in the Department of History in the School of Information there. And I work on the history of information technologies and knowledge infrastructures. I've mostly worked on uh, the history of computing and the history of climate science, especially climate models and climate data. We're at the HKW, the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in, in Berlin, and we are at the Anthropocene campus. And I am one of the many instructors here teaching about 130 or 140 students uh, about the Anthropocene. So I taught a seminar called Modeling Wicked Problems. I co-taught with Miriam Diamond of the University of Toronto and Pablo Jensen of the École Normale Supérieure Lyon. And we designed a seminar that would introduce students to simple models from the social sciences and also from the physical sciences. Most of the time we used a thing called the Global Systems Simulator, which is a simple simulation of global resources and how they are consumed and by people and what the limits to those processes are and how they interact with each other. So the goal of it was to teach people from the social sciences and humanities who haven't worked with models much about how models work and what their limits are, but especially to just get them familiar with things that happen deep in the guts of the models so that they don't have a, a sense of looking at them from the outside, but have some concept of how they work from within. So uh, my, my research career started with work on the history of computers during the Cold War in the United States mainly, but also about the relationship of the United States to the Cold War and the Soviet Union. And a lot of that work was about the construction of computer models of nuclear strategy and uh, even to some extent of the environment. It was a, partly about the origins of cognitive psychology and the origins of uh, large computer systems that could simulate very complex uh, systems. I never thought of it as being mainly about the environment, but after I finished that work, which came out in 1996 uh, in my book called The Closed World, it became uh, apparent to me that global climate change was an important issue and that some of the things about global climate change were tightly connected to the history of computers that I just studied. So to give one example of that, uh, Jay Forrester, who was an MIT computer scientist, he developed early computers for the SAGE air defense system that defended the continental United States. But he also was a principal developer of the limits to growth models that were part of the environmental movement in the 1970s and the famous World Club of Rome report called Limits to Growth. So they were connected even at the level of people. Uh, but the most important aspect of that was the building of complicated models of large scale systems that could let people understand what was happening to the environment on a global scale. Uh, so my research became directed first at the history of climate modeling. I worked with a, a very famous climate scientist named Steve Schneider at the university, at, at Stanford University, where I was at that time. And he taught me a great deal about how climate models work and introduced me to many climate modelers. I spent several years interviewing them and learning about how, model, how climate models work. They're, complicated, very computationally expensive. They rely on supercomputers, and they essentially uh, simulate all the physical processes that make up the circulation of the atmosphere around the planet. Uh, 
and also now the circulation of the oceans and the biosphere and uh, sea ice and snow and the many other parts of the climate system that all interact to give us the climate that we have. Uh, without those models, we would not know very much about where the climate system is likely to go in the future. And uh, that was the, gonna be the center of my research for a while. But the more I worked on that issue, the more I got interested in the problem of climate data. So how we know what we know about the history of climate and uh, how that connects with the modeling processes we use to project the future. So climate data are uh, almost as complicated as climate models because they come from many sources. Uh, they, if you think about it just on the historical time scale of a couple of hundred years, we have instruments at weather stations, thermometers, barometers, uh, other instruments that measure wind and lots of other things. And we collect all these data and compile them into a global record, but they've been created at different times with instruments that have different characteristics under different political regimes, under different regimes of standards, even at times under different scales of temperature and pressure. So just putting them together in one package that all works as a, as a piece is a complex problem. And as the 20th century went on, more and more instruments were added to that mix and the system became larger and larger. The most complicated part of it was the satellite uh, data system Satellites don't work like most other instruments. They, inst most instruments work by contact with the atmosphere, but satellites read radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And what they see is just a single quantity that then has to be broken down into elements that occur at lower altitudes. So you need to know where, what each component of the atmosphere is contributing to the total radiation signature that you see at the top. And that requires connecting these other records from these other kinds of instruments with satellites. It took 20 years really to resolve that issue. And the way it was done was with models. So data analysis models take uh, instrument data and grid them on a global scale. They assign them to points on a grid by interpolating among the uh, different places where they're actually taken. And then they uh, convert them into co coherent data sets where they're, all the quantities are measured against each other and tested to be sure that they're consistent. And uh, data are actually even created by data analysis models to complete the picture of the planetary atmosphere as a whole. So I just found that endlessly fascinating to see how uh, how much of the data stream is not simply collected, but created or at least refined by our uh, analysis systems. So one place you see that most easily is in the weather forecast network. There are large parts of the planet that are poorly covered by instruments, especially in the southern hemisphere and in the oceans. Um, data for a weather forecast for the whole planet have to be created for the empty grid cells in that picture. And our analysis systems now are so good that they can do this in some cases better than the instruments themselves. And I could, if I could show some pictures here, I would show you images of uh, instances where phenomena have been predicted in the complete absence of data for several days and then seen by satellites to have actually occurred. So uh, the book I wrote about this is called A Vast Machine. It's about computer models and climate data and also about the politics of global warming, which is very much connected to this whole issue of modeling. One of the criticisms that climate change deniers will constantly issue about climate uh, science is the idea that it's just a, uh, the, the model projections are somehow uh, made up or uh, too simple to be realistic. And the, 
My investigation into this, I actually started more or less from that point of view myself, and I, I was interested in the controversies over climate change and the uh, sort of seemingly problematic character of the forward projections of the future of the planet's climate. But the more I looked into this, the more I decided that really it was the critics who had misunderstood what was going on in climate science, because they had behind the critique is often the assumption that models are built only from theory or only from assumptions. And a lot of what I learned about them was that models incorporate a great deal of data that is empirical in nature and that there is a, there's a lot of discussion in the literature and among the scientists about how to make the model projections even more grounded in the measured quantities that they use to, to build models. So the, the, the critique has often been that if you tweak the knobs of the model, you can make it do anything you want. And so really the modelers are all kind of in a conspiracy to uh, make their models show global warming so that they'll keep on getting money for their research. But the complexity of modern climate models is such that that would be probably impossible for anyone to do. The, you, you can't you can't tune a model to get a single result without messing up everything else that goes on in the model so much that no one would believe your, your story. So that's kind of where the, that, that research project ended with uh, the, that book, A Vast Machine. Yeah, so continuities between military research and the climate change uh, world. That, that's a fascinating question, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and researching it. Uh, the, the link, as I understand it, turns out to be mainly at the level of uh, concept, conceptions of modeling the planet as a whole. So I mentioned the limits to growth model and, and Forrester's role in that. Uh, there were other ways in which the Cold War computing uh, aimed the military establishment, at least in the United States, at control ideas, how you were going to manage a military system that had to have a global reach and be able to respond instantly. There was a lot of connection with satellites because many of the, the earliest weather satellites were really launched as a cover for military spy satellites that were at that time of questionable legality. And it made, uh, it made very compelling kind of public relations story to say that we were doing something that was peaceful and for the good of humanity, uh, launching some weather satellites, while at the same time, uh, many satellites were also being launched that were photographing the, the Soviet Union and trying to find uh, missiles and air bases and things like that. Uh, those weather satellites weren't as important as people thought they would be in the 1960s because it took so long to figure out how to interpret their data for weather forecasting. But they were still really the beginning of a, of a new era in, in forecasting and then in climate science. Um, computer modeling of the climate there, there were a few military projects and I expected to find that they were very important, but in fact, that turned out not to be a major part of the story. There was some funding for that at some of the national laboratories, but the major part of the research was done in civilian laboratories. And a, a, a sort of surprising part of the story is that the civilian labs and their modeling efforts outstripped the military counterparts pretty quickly. And even in the area of satellite data, the civilian satellites eventually became so much better than the military satellites for weather forecasting purposes that the, that the US military canceled its uh, satellite programs uh, in that area because they were not needed. They, were, they, they weren't getting better data and they weren't producing better forecasts. That said, there were still a lot of important contributions. The, uh, the Air Force in particular was interested in clouds, which obviously are important for flying and bombing and, and so on. And they did a, a great deal of work on uh, NEF analysis, which is the uh, modeling of clouds and the, the projection of clouds. 
but by the time the climate change debate really got rolling in the 1970s, uh, the military was really a, a tiny piece of the picture. Interesting question. There are many kinds of models, including some that are very simple. And the first models, so to speak, were actually so simple that they, they, they could be solved on the back of a, a napkin. Uh, just a few equations, something you could do without computers, with, a, with only simple mathematics. Because the, you know, the, ultimately, the clim what we mean by climate is the temperature of the Earth as a whole. And you can see that as a problem of energy balance. The sun heats the planet, and if the planet did not release that heat, it would eventually burn to a crisp. So the energy is re-radiated into space, but some of it is retained because we have an atmosphere and oceans that hold some heat. So you can solve this as, a, as an equation that just represents the Earth as a single point and asks how much energy goes in, how much energy goes out, what is the stability of the, at, at what temperature does the Earth remain because of its atmosphere. But these days, uh, people have made much more complicated models that do many more things. And essentially, they try to simulate all the different elements of the climate system. So it started with atmosphere models. Uh, very complex physical system, essentially a fluid. Uh, can, the air, air around the Earth can be seen as a fluid that flows in complicated patterns. And you want to know what the patterns are and how they change as things like greenhouse gases are added to the atmosphere. So those models of the atmosphere are very closely connected to weather forecast models. They're actually, these days, often the same models are used to do weather forecasting and long-term climate projections. But there's a big difference. Uh, Weather forecast models are deterministic. So they take inputs of data and a simulation of the physical system and use those to project exactly what will happen over a short period, up to about two weeks. You can't do it beyond that time because the atmosphere is chaotic and we will never be able to predict it um, much beyond two or three weeks for that reason. But what you can do is represent uh, what happens over a very long period in terms of statistics. So in a climate model, you, you simulate weather, but the weather that you simulate isn't the weather of the real planet, it's the weather of the simulation. And then you take some statistical measures of what goes on in that atmosphere. So what is the temperature? What is the precipitation? Where does it fall? Uh, what, is the, what are the wind patterns? And so on. Modern climate models also have to include the oceans, because the oceans hold much more heat in the atmosphere, far, far more. And they also circulate. So the, you know, of course, everyone knows that the top layer of an ocean is quite warm. And if you dive down only a few meters, you'll be in a much colder part. So the, the water circulates, too. And as the atmosphere blows across the surface of the oceans, it absorbs some of that heat, but also transmits its own heat or cools the, the, the water. So that interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean is very much a part of the climate system. And the last piece I'll talk about is ice, because it's critical. There, the poles have a lot of ice. And uh, during the summers in, at the poles, the ice, some of that ice melts and then is re frozen in the, during the winter, the extent of the ice has a very important role in the climate system because it, uh, ice is white, so it reflects heat back into space. If the ice melts uh, in the Arctic, what's underneath it is water, which is darker and which holds heat. So the more ice we lose in the polar regions, we start a positive feedback where uh, it's revealing a darker surface that can hold more heat than the ice could, and it will eventually uh, turn into a very rapid feedback that melts more and more ice and uh, 
uh, changes the climate of the Earth as a whole. So I could go on and on. There are many, many complicated processes that enter into the climate system. But essentially, a climate model simulates as many of those processes as it can and uses that to try to, to project, I don't want to say predict, because that isn't really what they do, but to simulate, let's say, possible futures for the Earth's climate. Um, temperature is a piece of that, but there are many other parts. There's all, especially water. Uh, changing temperature means that more water is, uh, evaporates from the surface of the oceans. That means there's more water in the atmosphere as a whole, and it will eventually rain out somewhere. Some places will get more water and flooding, but other places will get drier. And if we are going to understand the future of the planet, we would like to know exactly where those places are and what will happen to them. So as I'm speaking right now, there is a very intense drought in California in the Western United States. Uh, that may be part of the future of that part of the world, or it may be part of natural variability, because there have been many droughts in California before. So one thing a climate simulation can do is help you understand how likely it is that this current drought is just another manifestation of the natural variability we would see no matter what people did or whether it might be caused by our own uh, activity, especially the emission of greenhouse gases. Plants play a very important role in the atmosphere because they live on carbon, and carbon dioxide is uh, what plant, we breathe oxygen, plants breathe carbon dioxide, they inhale it as it were and their waste product is oxygen, which we breathe. Uh, the, in the deep history of Earth, that relationship, the, you know, first the, the, the uh, appearance of plants on the surface, on the land surfaces, and their uh, creation of a, of a large amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is what permits us to be here at all in the first place. You can, plants do so much act activity on the atmosphere that you can see their action on, in the seasonal cycle of the, uh, especially of the northern hemisphere where most of the land mass is. Uh, in the summer months as plants are growing, the levels of carbon dioxide drop globally. And then in the winter, in, in the autumn, when they lose their leaves and the leaves begin to, uh, to reappear, I mean, the leaves begin to, to decay, uh, carbon is released into the atmosphere again. So, so everyone is probably familiar with the curves of the steady increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But if you look at that on an annual scale, it's a neat, jagged line where it goes up in the winter and down in the summer uh, for, the, for the whole planet. So when people say that the Amazon is the lungs of the planet, they're not kidding. It really is. It, the, the Earth breathes on a, on a global scale. Uh, so that is represented in climate simulations. It has to be. And agricultural cycles are part of that, too, because you know, they, they do the same thing. When we destroy a lot of forest land and replace it with crops that don't absorb as much uh, carbon dioxide. We reduce the capability of the biosphere to absorb the carbon that we produce by burning fossil fuels. So uh, the, those processes are incorporated. Biodiversity at the level of individual species is not so much because it's very uh, small scale, but at the level of whole uh, biomes of, of kind of areas with particular ecologies, we can see certain kinds of effects, and some of them are very important. They're, they're one of the questions about the future is what will happen to uh, uh, as carbon as there's more and more carbon in the atmosphere. What will happen to plants? Well, it turns out that there are two different ways, that, two different kinds of plants that absorb carbon dioxide differently. One grows better under conditions of higher carbon dioxide, and the other one doesn't really care. It's, it's not really influenced one way or the other. Even the ones that grow better eventually reach a limit of what they can absorb and then begin to, uh, their, their, their the carbon dioxide begins to be more like a poison for them, so they begin, their productivity begins to drop off.
So that'll have an influence on our agricultural systems too and on which crops grow well and which ones don't. And this follows from what I was just saying about the role of plants in the, uh, in the constitution of the atmosphere. I mean, we can, what Lovelock did was to think about the planet as a single kind of organism that in which the animal life and plant life are tightly interdependent. And, you know, we don't, we can't have animal life without plant life and vice versa. And the Gaia hypothesis really came down to the idea that the Earth self-regulated. So, if there were a lot more oxygen than there is now, I mean, even by just a few percent, everything would burn spontaneously because uh, combustion is the combination of oxygen with, uh, with carbon-based matter and, and, and other fuels. But if it were a lot lower, animal life couldn't exist. So the Gaia hypothesis says essentially that the Earth as a single organism maintains its own biosphere as a circulatory system that transfers oxygen to animals and transfers carbon dioxide to plants. So our waste products, our, we as people and other animals, become the, the, uh, the, the, the fuel, the, the food for, for plants and vice versa. So the climate models don't really represent Gaia as a, in, in that sense, but they are, what the processes they're showing tell us that the, that hypothesis was essentially right. We have been able to maintain a pretty stable relationship between carbon dioxide and oxygen for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, there have been, there's a lot of fluctuation and some of it is dramatic. It, it affects the reappearance of ice ages and, and so on. But it has remained in a range where both plant and animal life are stable. And if, as we begin to change it, uh, we are moving far outside the bounds of where carbon dioxide has been for the last uh, 800 million years or so. And we don't know what will happen. We might see in the distant future, uh, if this trend continues, some new stable state. Well, so the IPCC has used a couple of different processes over time, and the, to me the most interesting one was the so-called SRES, the, the, the Special Report on Emission Scenarios from the year 2000. In that report, they, they began with a set of stories. Uh, they convened some groups to talk about plausible futures that the Earth might experience. And they tried to uh, have a, a, a large range of plausible scenarios, but say one in which we go on doing what we're doing now, business as usual scenario with high rates of economic growth and a very globalized economy and uh, great level, high levels of inequality around the world. And others where things fell out differently. So a world with less globalization and more regional, uh, regionally organized economies, worlds with less growth in economic output and uh, uh, higher rates of renewable energy uh, coming online faster and, and other things. But so the, the idea was you, you develop a story that uh, about the, that's not just about one part of what happens in the world, but about the whole thing, or at least the, the major things that you think will, might influence the climate. And then each group took its story and modeled it using uh, what, are, what are called integrated assessment models that try to combine all these factors and figure out how much fuel will be burned, basically. But then other things that produce carbon too, such as cattle, which produce a lot of methane, and the many other greenhouse gases that we emit. So uh, that produced a set of curves of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which were then used as the basis for climate model projections in the uh, IPCC reports. So the, the outputs of the scenarios, the stories, became scenario curves of emissions. And those are, were not just a single line, but uh, you know, broken down into the various constituent elements of the greenhouse gas profile, and then used as inputs to the complex climate models I talked about earlier 
And what comes out of that is our projections for how the climate would change under each scenario. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is to start with a model and use that to produce a story. And that's what we did in this class I just taught with uh, here at the Anthropocene curriculum. So we used a system simulator that had a uh, sort of built into it a business as usual scenario that projects uh, kind of continuing the rate of population growth we have now out to about 9 billion people and uh, lots of other things that follow from that uh, population increase and economic growth. And the task the students were set was to try to bring the, uh, bring the world into balance to create enough food and enough uh, products for people to survive and uh, to stop the, the, uh, the environment from degrading and so on. So there were different ways they could do that. They could uh, institute, for example, a one-child policy to bring the population down. What effects would that then have on the other uh, elements of the world system? Or they could start a huge war and kill lots of people, or have an epidemic, or uh, adjust the, the, the production of energy toward more renewables and less use of fossil fuels. So all kinds of things that, that they could toy with in this very simple uh, model of the world. And they began by adjusting variables and then they were supposed to uh, try to produce a story that would explain how they could actually do that in the real world. So if you say, we're going to implement a global chi one child policy, how in the world would you ever do that? So most people didn't actually try to do that. <laughs> the war is easier to imagine, but still there you don't really, not really desirable outcome. So they, uh, they worked with lots of different possibilities and then tried to get to the point of saying, if we could make this world happen, here's how we would do it. So as I said, you can go both directions, from stories to uh, models or from models to stories, and both of those techniques are used. Now the, the last piece that I'd really like to talk about for a minute is uh, what models are for in policy making. Because I think there's a wide perception that somehow models govern policy. And in my experience in the climate change world of, of people who do this work, that's just not true. Um, they guide processes, political processes. They play a part in negotiations, but they never govern them. And no one takes the scenarios as a literal uh, prescription for how one would would act or should act. And there's really often a kind of level to which po models rise in the policy process and then stop. So bureaucratic elements of governments do a lot with, po with models to figure out what, the, what uh, regulations might do to a, a particular environment. But above the level of bureaucracy and sort of administration at the level of decision making about uh, large social problems, models have, are only a small part of a much larger kind of policy story about negotiation and uh, interest groups and money um, and trying to get along with other states if you're at that level. When I was really toward, a, toward the end of uh, working on my climate book, A Vast Machine, I began to think about it as an instance of a larger issue, which is the great changes we have experienced in the last 20 or 30 years around how we create knowledge and disseminate it and maintain it and destroy it and critique it and uh, uh, communicate amongst different areas of uh, different disciplines and different people in the world and different institutions. So modeling is an interesting piece of that process in science because what we see in the climate change case, but also in many other cases in science, is that communities come together around modeling projects that can communicate with each other. So in the case of climate science, uh, there was a convergence of modeling of the physical parts of the climate system, the atmosphere and oceans and the ice, but also of 
Ecologies and agriculture, which is a kind of human-managed ecology, and other things that had never really been thought of themselves as kind of affiliated with, a, with studies of the atmosphere or of the ocean. And the common project of trying to model futures of climate change meant that they had to talk to each other about standards and uh, quantities and variables that they could use in common to represent those processes. So it brings a kind of communication around simulation that, that's relatively new in the history of science. There's another aspect of knowledge infrastructures is on an even larger scale, which is that, of course, we're in the age of the internet and the World Wide Web. And part of what that means is that things that were once very hard to find and to read and understand are much more widely spread. At the same time, they're also much more easily attacked. And in the United States, where I live, uh, there is still a enormous uh, constituency of people who would like to believe that climate change either isn't real or is a kind of scientific conspiracy or is uh, uh, not caused by people, even if it is happening, and so on. And those people are able, because of the web, uh, to find other people like them and create communities of their own that constitute kind of counter discourses to the, the one that science produces. That phenomenon is everywhere. We see it around issues in medicine, like vaccines, uh, the recent Ebola crisis, and, and so on. Um, so I think we need to think a lot about the future of knowledge production and how the sort of pyramidal structure of expertise that we once had is being eroded. I'm not saying I want it back, but that there is a, a need to build a new sense of how we can create consensus and collective action around uh, knowledge projects that we currently don't really have. I don't know if I have a perfect answer to that question because I think it's an important new question. Part of why we're here at the Anthropocene curriculum is that the, the notion of the Anthropocene is relatively new and recent and is spreading everywhere as things do in the world, in the intellectual world. Um, and it is, since it is still young, it's not uh, entirely settled. So there is still a lot to, to say and to know about it and, and to shape about what the concept might mean. Uh, it comes in a way out of geology and one of the key questions right now is will the International Commission on Stratigraphy decide that we really are in the Anthropocene or not? But one could frame it differently. One could think about whether it's the right word. For example, it's another way to think about the the, the idea of an, a human influence on the geological time scale is that really the era we're in is an era of colossal waste. And the waste is generated by a capitalist production system. So Donna Haraway has said maybe we should call it the Capitalocene instead of the Anthropocene. Another thing we could do is, is think about uh, new kinds of philosophy and new kinds of history that, we would, that might be influenced by ideas of the Anthropocene. One thing I've seen happen recently in the humanities is a move toward new ways of teaching history to undergraduate students. So my university has a course called Zoom that starts at, with the Big Bang and comes all the way up to the present with uh, its investigations of history. And Bill Gates seems to think that that's a good idea. He's found some other professors who are doing similar things. Um, uh, the idea of the Anthropocene takes us into deep time and connects the human, uh, human history to that much longer history of which we're just a tiny speck. And really also gives us new notions of responsibility for, for the Earth. It's not the first time people have thought of that idea, but it might, might be a new way of, of conceiving it. And finally, there's the issue of cultural change and what it might do for, for us or to us as we go on, move forward. That the, the 
planetary systems we have are unsustainable and will, uh, will be destroyed if we continue doing what we're doing. Uh, some people might survive that, but not nearly at the levels we have now. So it, it makes us think about ethics. It makes us think about our, our children and their children, and their children's children, and what kind of world we will leave for them. Uh, how much we have a right to consume, how much we uh, need to know about what's going on all over the world and elsewhere as we work on our own little local lives, and how we can, how we can think about that in the future. Well, uh, in truth, I'm very pessimistic. I, I, I think that we've built an extremely efficient uh, production and consumption machine that has taken on almost a life of its own is really beyond the control of any government. Uh, we don't have a world government and we won't get one anytime soon. So I think it's not likely that we can uh, slow these processes very much with deliberate decisions. So I think some of it will happen, some of the I mean, change will happen, but I think some of it will come through natural and social catastrophe. Um, that said, uh, there have been huge social transformations in the past that have taken place very rapidly, and we can imagine that something like the idea of the Anthropocene would ignite a kind of general cultural transformation. The biggest problem is that uh, it's very, it's a, our needs and wants tend to ratchet upward. So once we get to a new level of consumption, it's very hard to go back, but we have more people than, can possibly, than we can possibly support on the planet already, and we're going to add another two billion over the course of the next uh, century. So I hope we can find a way out of that. Uh, I think there are some technological changes coming already that will that provide some hope, but I think we're gonna see some really damaging and dangerous uh, events in the not distant future that will uh, maybe help to wake us up. Thank you.